Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, a fierce critic of President Amazon Mnangagwa is arrested and charged with inciting violence in Zimbabwe. Journalist Hopewell Chinunu is accused of using his huge online following to encourage attendance at an anti-government protest planned for July 31st. Also, despite the documented abuses of those attending some Islamic schools in parts of Nigeria, some poorer parents in the north say that they don't want the notorious institutions shut down because they are often the only way they have a shot at offering their children an education. And we visit a disarmament, demobilization and reintegration camp, or a DDR camp, that's in Cameroon, where former secessionist fighters are trying to prepare themselves for civilian life, even as the Anglophone conflict they once participated in continues. But first, a Zimbabwean journalist is due to appear in court on Wednesday, charged with inciting public violence. Hopewell Chinono was arrested on Monday in a police raid on his Harare home. Chinono's gained prominence as a fierce critic of President Emerson Manangagwa's government. He has a huge online following, and the police accuse him of using his social media to encourage the public to join anti-government demonstrations planned for next week. Their organiser, opposition politician Jacob Garivume, has also been arrested. How we were joined now with uh, Ryan Truscott, who tells us more. Ryan, um, is this going to be a massive problem for Chinono? How serious are the charges that he's facing? Well, potentially they are, are serious. It, 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 the, the charges he's facing uh, carry a five-year jail term on conviction. Uh, the, the government's accusing him of uh, inciting public violence uh, by urging people to take part in a, a public demonstration next week. Uh, but many of his supporters are seeing this as punishment for speaking out against corruption uh, because Chonono has spoken out about a, a corruption scandal involving Zimbabwe's health ministry and its procurement of medical supplies. That scandal led to the arrest and sacking of the health minister, uh, Obadiah Moyo, last month. So Chonono is seen uh, by many here as, as a, a crusading anti-corruption hero, uh, and his arrest will be seen as an attempt to to silence them and to discourage others from speaking out in the same way. And as you mentioned, there is this uh, a second critic in, in custody facing the same charges, and, and that man is Jacob Ngari Vume. He's the leader of a, a small opposition party. He's been calling for people to join the protest on July 31st. But in a video post on his Twitter account, he did make it clear uh, that those protests could be peaceful. So what are the protests about and are they likely to go ahead with the two men in prison at the moment? Well, they're, they're being called to, to mainly to protest against uh, this alleged government corruption uh, and it does have the backing of, of the main MDC party led by Nelson Kamista, although they, they aren't the organisers. Uh, look, it'll be very difficult for it to go ahead. There may be a few who try to demonstrate, uh, but this evening... President Emerson Mnangagwa announced the tightening of coronavirus lockdown measures, including a, a dusk to dawn curfew to be enforced by the security forces as from tomorrow. And there's also going to be a ban on all, or a ban will continue on all social, political and religious gatherings. So obviously that ban will, will cover this planned protest on the 31st of July. Some, some of these lockdown measures are, are seen as targeting the opposition. Uh, at a time of growing frustration over the economic crisis here and, and food shortages. Uh, but Menengagwa said in his speech this evening that because of the increase in coronavirus infections, and he mentioned that there had been more than 600 in the last week alone, uh, that these measures are being taken to minimise loss of lives. He said that no responsible government can put its people in harm's way. Thanks very much. Ryan Truscott there for us in Harare. Well, in other news, dozens of supporters of ousted longtime Sudanese leader Omar al Bashir gathered outside a Khartoum courthouse on Tuesday as he appeared before judges. He's been charged over the 1989 coup that toppled the elected government of the time and brought him to power. The trial was quickly adjourned to August the 11th at the request of al Bashir's defense team. He's been in jail since he was overthrown by the military last April. 
Ethiopia said that it's reached an understanding with Egypt and Sudan over their commitment to keep up negotiations about a controversial dam that's ramped up regional tensions. Talks had stalled over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam as both Sudan and Egypt fear that the project will restrict their share of the Nile's waters. African Union Chair and South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has been mediating discussions. Addis had already said that it was set on filling the dam's reservoir this month, with or without an agreement. The site's water level is currently at its highest in four years. Ethiopia says the waters have risen because of heavy rains. Nigerian senators have called for military chiefs to quit. The Senate passed a resolution on Tuesday demanding the resignations because of deepening insecurity in the country. The armed forces have struggled to quash a jihadist insurgency that first began in 2009 and has since cost over 35,000 lives. President Bahamadou Buhari is stuck by his military top brass, though, and said that he'll be the one to decide if they need to be replaced. And Nigerian police say that they've freed 15 children who were being abused at an Islamic school. All of the captives were reportedly between two and 10 years old and being held at an informal Quran school in Suleja in Niger state. Officers say that they showed signs of torture. Religious institutes called al Majiri schools have increasingly come under criticism in Nigeria for mistreating those attending them. Authorities in the north have decided to close them down, but some poorer religious families say that, they're, that they are their only schooling options. Shirley Sitman has more. These children and many others across northern Nigeria will soon have to leave their schools. These informal madrasas or Quranic schools have taught children to count and read by reciting the Quran. But criticism over their living conditions, the fact they have to sleep on the floor and beg for money, has pushed 19 northern states to shut them down. Begging is not the only problem. In recent years, several madrasas have been accused of exploiting children. In some schools, pupils have been approached by fundamentalists. And there have been cases of abuse and even torture. So when the coronavirus epidemic broke out, authorities quickly shut those madrasas down, a decision some students regret. According to some estimates, more than 10 million children aged 5 to 14 are out of school in Nigeria. Even as Cameroon's Anglophone crisis continues, some of the separatists who once fought for independence for the country's English-speaking communities have put down their weapons in the hope of reintegrating into civilian life. The government's 2018 offer of amnesty for those who agreed to stop fighting was not widely taken up. But those who did accept have been attending special camps. Our correspondents visited one. Regina Sondo reports. The Cameroonian national anthem has been sung by dozens of former English-speaking separatist fighters. In the past, they detested the anthem. Now, every morning, they observe the raising of the national flag. Roll call for the 120 former separatist fighters who chose to lay down their weapons and surrender. They belong to armed groups fighting in a struggle to establish their English-speaking state called Ambazonia. Some of the young men aged 18 to 35 come to the center with women and children. This is a newcomer in the camp, a 21-year-old ex-combatant who wants to remain unidentified. He was an armed militia for three years, and it took him another year to get out of the bush. The center is located in Bamenda, epicenter of a three-year civil war. 
The site is guarded 24 hours per day by the bee, an allied military force. The national anthem is the reflection of the country. On today's menu is the so-called moral rearmament course. The Cameroonian government promised former separatists total amnesty. This convinced many to abandon the fight. Nobody is going to say, okay, we'll take this one for firing squad because he killed somebody here or because he burnt a house here or something. We just started with four and uh, it has been going very gradually. In another section of the building, a computer science class is underway. Raise your wrist. This course is delivered as part of the Disarmament Demobilization Reintegration Program. Emmanuel, who arrived here a year ago, is the only one who wants to testify without hiding his identity. He does not regret laying down his weapons. Some atrocities like uh, cutting the neck, uh, the, the head of a military man and then planting uh, around the carifu wasn't human for me. About 10 kilometers away, a new camp that can accommodate 1,000 other ex-separatist fighters in two to three months is under construction. Meanwhile, fighting continues in the rest of English-speaking regions where the two warring parties often abuse victims of the conflict. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Take care.